Welcome, everybody. My name is Dustin Goes to Hollywood. I am Mally Moore. And this is the first episode of the Silver Linings Playlist. Uh, we're a podcast that tries to find the silver linings in some of, some of cinema's most bleak endings. And that is our goal for this podcast. Uh, thank you for tuning in, everybody. Again, like I said, this is our first episode, so bear with us. Uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly how the structure of this is going <laughs> to go. Um, so, yeah, who are we? We are both film students uh, who just genuinely love movies. And I think we kind of have an understanding that we really appreciate the uh, the movie with the ending that's not so great uh, in terms of the characters, I guess, what happens to them. Uh, I know there's a word for it. It's like uh, something defeats uh, some kind of there's a script term for it. Right, right. Where your your character doesn't have. Uh, we should probably look that up. Sometime. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as students, we should probably know that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and this first episode is just a heavy hitter. Probably one of the, the most prime examples of bleak endings uh, in a movie. But. We are going to try and find the silver lining in it. Yes. And uh, that is our first film, uh, Requiem for a Dream. The year is 2000. Director Darren Aronofsky's second feature film uh, starring Ellen Burstein, Jared Leto, Jennifer Conley, Marlon Wayans, and Christopher McDonald. Uh, the film itself had a budget of $4.5 million and only grossed $7.3 million worldwide. Really? Only that uh, very, very, yeah, didn't really do too big. But it's IMDb uh, rating is number 78 in their top 250. Okay. Uh, it's certified fresh, also at 78% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Premier voted uh, this movie as one of the 25 most dangerous movies ever. <laughs> and it's number 13, so it's right right smack dab in the middle okay okay uh and uh, ellen burstein was nominated for an oscar for best actress uh as sarah goldfarb and uh, who did she lose to <laughs> she lost to uh julia roberts in aaron brockovich that is a damn shame yeah and that year didn't have much going on for it in terms of best actress at least in my opinion i i no. thought ellen burstein could not you know knock this out of the park absolutely uh just that monologue right smack in the middle of the movie alone the, is, the whole cast in yes, this yeah, kills it. Yeah. Even, it, you know, Christopher McDonald works as the fucking oh, uh, he's infomercial spokesperson. Astounding <laughs> in his very limited Very limited run. Time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's Requiem for a Dream in a nutshell. Uh, if you're not familiar with the movie, uh, let's go ahead and listen to the trailer. Purple in the morning, blue in the afternoon, orange in the evening. Just like that. One, two, three, four. So yeah, it's pretty visual trailer. Uh, For sure. Yeah. So you know, obviously, if you haven't seen the film, check out the trailer before you watch the movie. Uh, and if you haven't seen the film, turn this podcast off right now because we're going to oh, talk about yeah. it in great detail. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Maybe so, too much. <laughs> yeah. So we're definitely going to spoil it. And at the end, after we've discussed the whole movie, we're going to try and find the silver lining in Requiem for a Dream. All right. So I guess we should just get right into it. So... Let's talk about the the beginning of the movie, right? Um, you just get thrown right into right like, smack into the it, lives like, of yeah. these characters. We're introduced to uh, Tappy Tibbins, uh, and this uh, is this just like an infomercial for like 
Yeah. What is this? It's like an, it's obviously it's an infomercial. The character of Sarah, apparently it's the only thing she ever watches because it's, it's the only thing ever on television. And it's running apparently 24 hours. Yes. Because she's watching this at all hours of the day. Now, it's been a while since I've had cable. So maybe that's what things are like now. Or maybe that's what they were like back then. I don't know. You know when they but always they always say unsettling. they always say there's only like three channels. <laughs> this was one of them. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. So yeah, it's, I think it's kind of there to heighten this sense of surrealism that like this is the only thing that's on. Well, yeah, because that I don't know if that entire I, I guess sequence is in the book, but the character Tabby Tibbins mm-hmm. was not in the book at all. Okay, he's, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's completely made up for the movie. So she she was just addicted to being on a t- on television in general. In the yeah, book. I'm not sure if they ever specify like what it is she's watching all the time. Mm-hmm. But I know the whole sequence with the infomercial was was added for the for movie. The film, yeah. oh, okay, and well, it works incredibly well. Yeah, in the context and of we it. never see anything else on a television screen. I don't think other than uh, when Harry's waiting for uh, Marion to come back from sleeping with her psychiatrist. Right, right. He's watching. He's but he's watching an infomercial too. Yeah, yeah. So and he different them, commercial, but different commercial, but still some, tr- somebody trying to sell you something. Um, so that, I thought that kind of parallel was interesting. He she's watching this this infomercial about it's not even about losing weight; it's just about it's, taking it's like, taking yeah, control, like self improvement. Yeah, much. yeah. Whereas it's, it's he's looking rules. into yeah, and he's looking into consumerism almost. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of weird. But yeah. So apparently, this is a reoccurring thing where Harry steals his mom's television pawns it off and she buys it back uh which i thought was it's completely be you know in in a real relationship could easily be just be like mom i need some money here you go right but the fact that they have to go through this length and it's a reoccurring thing that happens year after year you know month day after day month after month it's yeah and (sighs) they they like they don't really specify how many times it's happened that he's mm-hmm. done this, but I know later on when she goes to buy the television back, mm-hmm. pops that little the um, little book open, book yeah, open. You see just her name, her name like ten times in a row. Yeah, and that's of course played by a uh, famous, famous actor uh, Mark Margolis, who's in everything, yes. <laughs> yeah, literally everything. Um, so yeah, that of course is foreshadowing kind of this idea of addiction. He's addicted to taking his TV, or at least he's in the uh, the throes of repetitive motion of right. I've got to do this to get this money, so I can do this, so I got to get this money, to do this, and she's in the same thing in this this motion. Uh, but yeah, you're you're right. We get just thrown into this shit like um, from frame one. Uh, and then, you know, we're introduced to, uh, Tyrone and we're introduced to, uh, Marion and kind of just seeing how their relationships are. But yeah, we, without even really, I don't think we even learn their names. We just get right into the crazy quote unquote hip hip hop montage. Yes. That Aronofsky does for this movie. That's just unreal. Just the editing alone in this movie should have been nominated for an Oscar if it I wasn't. I completely agreed. Um, the editing for this movie was on a whole different level. <laughs> it's it's all it's its own character. Oh yeah, no, yeah, com- yeah, for sure. Um, we introduced this hip hop montage of drugs and just kind of watching the after. Like I think that's kind of a good thing that this movie does. They don't really show you needles and arms. They don't really show like the whole process. They kind of they do those quick cuts, so you're like, okay, we're going from right. Like you get the idea, but yeah. it's not like something. It's not l- the whole process of them actually doing it isn't yeah. really long and drawn out. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of that less is more thing. We don't need to see yeah. him putting a needle in his arm. We get this quick montage. Now we're in it, um, which I really appreciate. That's just such a creative way to direct something Except like that. Towards the end, there is that shot when obviously we warned you already. Spoilers. <laughs> When his arm is very infected, yeah. there is that long shot of the needle. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Which I wonder if that was intentional, not showing it the whole film to build up to, to that, that one shot. moment. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of matching that could have been done with something like right. that and keep that same kind of suspense going on. But yeah, so again, uh, it's just we're just in the throes of addiction, and there's a scene where Tyrone 
is talking to Harry at this like donut shop and talking about how they can get a pound of pure heroin to sell. And there's the scene with the cop, the hallucination scene, that for the life of me, I can't figure out what the purpose of it is other than to just have some fun, really. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I have seen this movie so many times, and I have never quite understood what that scene is supposed to represent yeah. at all. Maybe it's just the idea of him like flirting with like doing something illegal, like taking these drugs, selling it and everything. Right, yeah. And it almost comes to this like game of back and forth. Maybe that's what it is because they're playing like keep away with the gun mm -hmm. and the cop. That's the only thing I can really come up with. Uh, but it is certainly fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's interesting. It kind of loses itself on repeat watches, though. The first yeah. time you see it, it's pretty great. Um. So, yeah, we're at the pawn shop, you know, the, the pawn shop owner says, why don't you go to the police? She says she can't because it's her son. And I get that. I can kind of understand the idea of yeah, not wanting to take her son. It's her in. only child. She. But it's also, I kind of noticed this parallel uh, effect where she could save him from his addiction by turning him in to the police, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the near the end, when he realizes that she's on diet pills, he could save her. By taking her in. Right. Not yeah. necessarily to the police, but to get help, right? They could save each other throughout the movie, and they don't. Um, because they're just so addicted to whatever it is, whatever their uh, choice of poison is, pretty much. So it's like, like you said, we get thrown into the shit from frame one, and uh, there's so many opportunities for people to get out, and they don't. Yeah, there really is. <laughs> so... It it warrants. I mean, we're, we're jumping ahead to the end, but it warrants that ending. Like, oh yeah, completely. everyone gets completely. what they deserve by the end, um, because they've had chances to, you know. And I understand addiction; it's hard right. to, yeah, no. to you know. I I can't ever say I've been addicted to anything, but I cannot certainly put myself in a mindset where I'm just so dependent on something that I don't want to look at, you know, ways to come out of it. Right. Uh, so I can totally understand it, but it's just so that's the part that the ending like really gives me like some kind of resonation like resonated effect where i completely understand why we got this ending um and it's deserved it's not just like a sad ending just to have a sad ending you know what right. i mean right um well and the whole the whole film built like there's no other way the movie could have ended mm -hmm. there's just because it builds to that ending the entire movie and there's really just I, I can't think of any other way. Yeah, I mean, I don't for that movie. I feel like anything other than that would have just been, yeah, like it would almost. You know, one of the problems with like movies that do have like these sad endings is it's kind of almost retrofitted. Like you right, start with the ending yeah. and work backwards, but I feel like this one they just it's kind of the organic build your characters. What would they do in the situation? Where their heads at? What actions would they do? Why would they do that? And it kind of builds up to this ending, which is like the you know, the ultimate effect of right, all of that. Exactly. So, um, so Sarah is, gets this phone call watching her show that she has won a chance, uh, to be on this TV show. But the phone call itself is kind of iffy to me because I don't think she, they ever say, and I'm actually looking at the script now. I mean, of course it could change, uh, based on the final version, but they don't ever say that they're affiliated with the actual infomercial, Right. We, that she's watches. We discussed this a little, uh, for a little bit earlier before. Mm -hmm. What, what is that phone call? Yeah. Is it like, and I've always watched it assuming it was some kind of like, not telemarketing, but like a spam. Yeah. Like a spam call. kind of thing going on. But you pointed out that it, the entire thing could be a hallucination. Uh, yeah. And I, I kind of talked about this with my girlfriend today because we were watched it, uh, before we recorded this, but you know, I posited the idea. I'm not saying it's, it's you know, necessarily fact. But I said, maybe this is just a hallucination of hers. And then she pointed out, well, she does get a letter in the mail. Her friends see it. They help her fill it out. I'm like, that's true. That's a good point. Um, but then I, I kind of like this idea that you mentioned of it could be like a spam thing. Like, you know, you get them in the mail all the time. Oh, you've won two tickets to the Bahamas. Right. We just need you to fill this out. Because, yeah, from what the script says, it says that this guy is calling from Malin and Block... And that they are like uh, a casting kind of thing, right? Huh. 
Uh, they discovered contestants for most of America's favorite television shows, right? That's what it says anyway in the script. Okay. Uh, they never say, you know, Tabby Tippin or the juice thing. They never mention all that. So it's it could very, could very well be a scam thing. It honestly could be legitimate in them saying, you know, we want you to be on TV. Right. Here's something that I kind of noticed, and I looked it up on IMDb, and they kind of confirmed it, and we talked about this earlier, too. Yeah. Um, she gets the letter in the mail, right? She fills out all her info, and she goes to put in the mailbox. <clears throat> um, on that envelope of the letter she's putting in the mailbox, there's no stamp on it. Okay. Okay? So there's a possibility that she puts this envelope in the mail, with no stamp, and it just doesn't go anywhere because it's right, a stamp. Just, yeah. And because by this point, she's already started getting into those diet pills and everything, that she starts losing her mind, that she maybe just doesn't check the mailbox to see that it's returned to her. Because mm-hmm. I don't... I think once she starts popping the pills, that she never goes to back to the mailbox. And uh, Yeah. Not that it. Not that we're shown. Anyway. And there's a little quick montage of her checking it, like the yeah, actual yeah. physical mailbox, but I, I mean, obviously, could be, you know, weeks before they get back right, with yeah. you. Right, um, yeah. Then again, it could be, you know, we don't really, it's hard to tell on the actual vote. It could be like one of those prepaid postage things. So this is just a theory. True, it, yeah, I could yeah. be way off, but that's my under. That's what, I, that's the fan theory that I like to yeah, say as yeah, fact. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think that she just didn't put a stamp on it. And, uh, you and know, it's they just never sitting got, there in the mailbox. Yeah, it's forever. just sitting there, uh, which makes it even more heartbreaking yes. of the ending we get that some people are so determined to be on television <laughs> or to lose weight that they literally go insane. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that again, that's just a theory, but I like the way it sounds. So okay. if I was writing the script, that's probably something I would do. Um, I'll patiently await your remake of it then. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's been 16 years. I think it's a remake. It's definitely within the realms of a remake, right? The way they're doing them now, yeah, probably. <laughs> Not saying it needs one, but no, it's no, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, neither um, did Memento, but. Yeah, and so. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> so we get. This uh, red dress that Sarah's obsessed with. Did you notice this? Because I noticed it upon this watching that the red dress that she tries on that she's just a little too overweight for is a different dress than her actual hallucination when she's on the TV show. Is it? It is. It, the, the dress that she picks out from her closet is the trimming on it is kind of like flat, like around the collar. Okay. And then in the show, it's more ruffled. I worked in fashion for five years. And I completely miss that every time. <laughs> yeah, I just so noticed I'm it today. I'm so disappointed in myself. I just noticed it today. And I wonder if maybe that has something to do with maybe she... Because, you know, she said she used to fit in this red dress. And, you know, right, right. I think she said she even, like, met her husband in, or went on... It's something something with her lines, husband, yeah. 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 So yeah. I'm thinking maybe she just is having this grand illusion of, like... You know how, like, you have rosy red glasses? Like, things were always so much better back then. Yeah. Then I'm thinking she's like, oh, if I can get, just get into this dress, I'll look better. It's all ruffled. And her hair is done red and yeah. done up. But in reality, it's like this flat, almost orangey kind of dress. Okay. That's not very flattering. Or, you know, it looks like an old lady dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus like this idea but of like a red. Mind, it's very. Like a cocktail dress yeah, almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something I noticed today. So. Yeah, I never picked up on that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're introduced to this red dress. And she's like, you know, I can't fit in it. So I'm going to try and go on this diet. Yeah, in and there, sister. This diet sounds awful. Grapefruit coffee yeah. black and was it a three boiled eggs or a boiled egg or something like that i think it was one boiled just egg, one. wasn't it like a not even a whole grapefruit like yeah. a wedge of grapefruit yeah yeah no sugar uh black coffee and boiled eggs that that just sounds so awful <laughs> i like all three of those things don't get me wrong but mm. i want a lot more of yeah. all of that. I think that's also a good a good part to bring up uh, Tabby Tippin's three rules for success, whatever you want to call it. Yes. The first one is is no sugar, yeah. right? And that's they, in the context of the film itself. They do mention two of the three. Yes, and we're gonna get into that too at the end when we yeah. you know talk about some stuff. But yeah, first one is no sugar, so she obviously goes with that. Uh, and the second one is red meat. Avoid red meat, uh, which are two things I have a problem with. Uh, <laughs> is avoid. Yeah. I'm kind of kicking the sugar habit, but red meat I'm is... I'm definitely not doing that. Yeah, red meat, will, to the day I die, I'll be red meat. Um, but we never reveal the third one, which we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. So we get rid of the sugar. We know, I don't think we ever see her eat meat. So she's got this diet. You know, she just has to stick with it, right? Uh, and, you know, I think 
not necessarily diets per se, but we've all tried to put ourselves in a situation like, okay, I'm going to try and avoid this thing. Right. Yeah. Right. For me right now, it's I'm going to try and drink a gallon of water a day and it's rough and you <laughs> fall like you fall very quickly, especially when it comes to food related things that you're trying to kick the habit for it. So, yeah. of course, she, you know, the diet doesn't work and her friend suggests diet pills. She goes to this doctor, right? And we'll come back to that later. So, um, yeah, uh, Harry and Marion and Tyrone, you know, have this idea. We're going to get this money. We're going we're, we're to get this heroin. We're going to sell it. We're going to make enough money to buy this pure and sell it. So it's kind of like a whole they, plan they got. They never refer to it as heroin. They, that is true. They never say the word heroin in the film. Uh, that's a good point. They refer to it as pure and I think skag is yeah. something else they call it. Um, so yeah, they start raking up money and just like twenty dollar bill like bundles. Yep. A lot of fucking money, right? Yeah. That's another point. They they have money there. Okay. They could easily stop there, you know, and invest it or, you know, whatever. Well, and going off of that, they mention that like obviously Harry comes from not so much a broken home, but his his mm-hmm. father died young. Right. Um I don't know if they ever really dive into Tyrone's backstory, but they do mention like Marion's from, uh, I mean, kind of an upper class family. Yeah, they. I don't. I think they said her father was in the garment business. I don't know if they yeah, ever yeah. mentioned her mother. So yeah, they have money. Um, they're just you know their addictions are kind of their undoing. Yeah, and yeah, Tyrone's whole thing is that he has a loving mother. I guess he just. I think his whole. Like journey is he's trying to f- make a home better for himself now right. that he doesn't have his mother, um, which again we'll talk about that at the yeah. end. Um, it all comes back around. Yeah. So they get this money and uh, Tyrone tries to enter this business deal with this. We just we were trying to talk about this scene before we started this this deaf drug dealer in this limousine. Uh, this scene is not in the book, right? No, no, it is okay, not. Okay, so it's crafted specifically for this. I like the fact that Aronofsky made the drug dealer deaf. I don't know why. It's just a neat little kind of character characterization kind of thing that okay. he does. It's really interesting to me. Um, but yeah, so... I'm, I'm curious as to what his reasoning behind it, because with that scene not being in the book... Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I wonder where his mind was, where he's like, "I'm gonna make this guy deaf." Yeah, because I don't know in the book why Tyrone gets busted. I'm assuming just a drug deal gone bad or something. You I'm know, here sure. it's you know same, pretty pretty much same thing. I guess it's just a different take on it. And but maybe in in my opinion, maybe one of the most intense scenes of the movie for me. God, yeah, especially the fact that they you know the partition rolls down, the guy turns around, shoots the guy blood splatters all over Tyrone and then just we get the and text. Yeah, you get that big just cut of just real quick that text. title card. Of yeah, I think it says like fall. fall. Yeah, fall. And then just cut straight to that mm-hmm. snorry cam. Yeah, that shot him running of him down him just running down the alley screaming. Yeah, that's such, it's such a good scene. I mean, Which, but yeah, that's uh, that's almost like the inciting incident for the rest of the movie. For these three characters, anyway. Yeah, that's definitely kind of the turning point. Yeah. So where Tyrone things go from bad to worse, pretty much. Yeah. So Tyrone gets busted, um, and they have to use all the money they had saved up to uh, bust him out of jail, pretty much to his bail. Um, so now they're out money and they're out of heroin, and uh, they decide they're gonna. Well, first of all, uh, Harry says he's gonna. You know, visit his mom yeah. and buy her a new TV. Uh, this is before Tyrone gets busted, I guess. Yeah, I guess I um, kind of jumped over that. So, a couple things about this scene. Uh, one... It's terrifying. Just, yeah. <laughs> one, just based on the plot itself, he's enabling her addiction to television even further. Yeah. He, yeah. So, while he's also presenting her with this, you know, nice gift of a new television, he's also enabling her... He can also save her, and he doesn't, because this is where we also find out that she's on that he finds out she's on diet pills, um, and she you know she's got the teeth chattering, and that's when she goes into this monologue, and this monologue oh, is man. fucking devastating. If you have a grandparent that's a widow, or if your mother or father 
are widowed and they're they're kind of older this resonates with you because my mother i'm adopted my mother is gonna be uh 78 this year and her husband my grandfather died in 1998 Mm -hmm. so it's almost been 20 years she's been alone and i could i'm she's a strong woman yeah but if she came out and gave me this monologue i would 100 percent believe it 100 percent sympathize with her and just this this is by far just like even disregarding the rest of the film, even the ending, this is by far the heaviest moment of the film for me emotionally. <laughs> I mean, it's monologue. It's it's true to the character, and geez, dude, like this is the. I feel like a lot of older people feel this way, but they're afraid to say it because right, they don't want to yeah. appear weak. But yeah, I completely. Yeah, she's alone. She doesn't have her husband. She doesn't see her kid. All she has is the television, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> just like, this. It's not even just like what she's saying. It's which Ella, like her delivery mm-hmm. is so her mannerisms, like good. The fact that her eyes are going back and forth. Yeah, her, and she's her, constantly, her head's kind of constantly bobbing, bobbing her bit. New York accent, her teeth are kind of moving from side to side. It's how did she not win this Oscar? <laughs> Dude, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah, just, I just went from like getting sad, and now I'm just pissed off again. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Harry leaves um, after you know talking to his mom about uppers that she should get off uppers. Um, he mentions her that he's planning on marrying Marion, Marion, Marion. Yeah, um, and then he cries in the cab. So that kind of reinstates my idea that he could save her, and he just doesn't. Yeah. Because I think he shoots up in the cab well, as well. I think that's a good like it's it's sim- it's kind of a mirrored scene from the beginning when he's there to pretty much pawn her, take her TV and pawn it. Yeah. Um. Like you really like you can tell throughout this movie you really see how much these two characters really like love each other. Yeah. But again, when the opportunity is presented to save them. They don't. They don't. Yeah. I feel like every character loves one another. Like he loves his mom. She loves him, but they they're so in like in the throes of their own addictions. Right. That they right. Can, yeah. Um, same thing with him and Marion. They love each other. And then there's a part, you know, where she can't sleep. So she just suggests they shoot up. He says no, because they have to have something to sell. And then the mm-hmm. next morning she's blaming him for shooting up yeah. with her, you know, um, but then there's also like beautiful scenes like them too, like the split screen of them like telling each other how much they love each other and like the close ups of like him rubbing her mm-hmm. hair and stuff like that. It's so it works so well. You believe their love immediately. This it's just it's an emotional roller coaster, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, a little more downs than ups. But. <laughs> it's like a roller coaster that only goes down. Yes. <laughs> um. So Sarah starts popping more than one of these pills. Uh, more of these diet pills, two at a time, three at a time. And this is where she has kind of her hallucination watching this uh, infomercial, and she envisions herself on the show. And this is, like I said, where you see the ruffled red dress. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a different dress by 100%. Um, yeah, so she starts having her th- her her delusion on the TV, and you know she runs out of the house in a panic. Um, is that the scene with the breakaway set that they do? Yeah, I believe that is. Yeah, where they do like the set breaks apart and she's in front of the camera and everything. Um, just God, that terrifying. That refrigerator terrified the piss out of me seeing this for the first time. Right? <laughs> I've never been scared so scared of an inanimate object. Um, they do that scene well, so well too. That shot of her running down the sidewalk where. Mm-hmm. It like she's in almost in slow motion, but everyone else around her is yeah. just moving like a blur. Yeah, it's just so it's so unsettling. Yeah, and especially when you find out when they right as she runs out, you find out that she hasn't been watching anything on the television. It's just mm-hmm. been you know the color bars with the one K tone. It's even more like uns- that's kind of the, oh yeah woman. that she's that she's losing her mind. Yeah. Um. So yeah, they uh, Tyrone and. Uh, Harry decide that uh, they're gonna. They got this word about this uh, pure heroin that's coming in that they're gonna try and get a piece of. 
uh, and they go to this this uh, grocery store, right? Yeah, yeah, supermarket. Supermarket, yeah. Um, so they go in the back, and there's tons of drug dealers, right? Uh, junkies, everybody trying to get part of this heroin to sell. And, of course, something goes wrong, and a junkie pulls out a gun, which sends everybody scattering, which... I'm wondering, like, if in, like, lower-income places, if things like this happen in, like, the back of supermarkets and stuff like that. Because that seemed... I don't know if that was, like, fantasized just because it seemed cooler to do that. Yeah, because, like... Like, is that, is that what's going on in the back of Whole Foods? Yeah. Or, I mean... <laughs> no, that's in the back of, like, Piggly Wigglies, man. <laughs> <laughs> Whole Foods would put their heroin, like, it's organic, it's going to be out on the shelves. <laughs> um... All right. Did you notice uh, the bald man in the fur coat who's like give, distributing out the heroin is peeling an orange? Bane was in this movie. <laughs> yeah, Bane's peeling an orange. Did you notice that? No. And and of course, uh, oh, the, Godfather. Yes, yeah. Okay. So the, Godfather, the, the orange symbolizes death. It's approaching, yeah. but it also is good, kind of like two hitter because it also symbolizes. Uh, the Florida aspect of like they're going to head out to Florida because that's where the guy is, you know. So it's kind of a double whammy. And then, of course, they see the truck drive off that says Florida, you know. Oh, you know, we kind of, kind of skipped a scene, too. Uh, Marion has to meet her psychiatrist Oh yeah, to get some oh, money yeah. because they don't have any money. After they bail Tyrone out, uh, they're running low on funds, obviously. So she has to whore herself out to her, pro- to her psychiatrist mm-hmm. In order to make uh, to make some money, which they they kind of not reference, but she does have dinner with him towards the beginning of the film as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and it seems like her her therapy is going well. I mean, she's having a, which I don't think it's necessarily appropriate to have dinner with your psychiatrist, well, but she says the whole reason she has to go to dinner with him in the first place is it's almost like a form of blackmail because mm-hmm. she's not going to therapy anymore, right? And he doesn't. She doesn't want him to tell her parents, right? So, so he, why is she that? She has to go to dinner with him so that he won't yeah. tell her parents. Is it because she's so addicted to heroin and stuff that she just doesn't I don't think go? They ever really say why? Because she seems like she has ways how easier than every right. one of them do. I don't really think they ever say why she was in therapy or why she really stopped going. Yeah, that's just kind of. A little ambiguous as right. to what's going on there, and I don't think they ever use the word prostitute either or anything like that. She no, they like it's all like as like obviously you do see the thing she's doing, mm-hmm. but they never really say it out loud, if you will. Yeah, well, she has a really good line too, where Harry's trying to convince her, and she says, you know, getting the money is not the problem. You just don't know what I'll have to do to get it, and that's kind of like the oh kind of moment yeah. uh which i it's such a jeez, dude i i mean there's so much thing going on there there's manipulation there's abuse um yeah there's there's just so many scenes in this movie where you know what's about to happen but and they don't even have to come out and say it and it just happened <laughs> well and then even like you you will know something's about to happen and you think you're ready but then it happens you're just like nope yeah was yeah. not ready for that yeah Anyway, so Harry uh, apparently has an infected arm uh, from shooting up. You know, um, it's starting to get infected and it doesn't look good. But him and Tyrone have this idea. We're going to go to Florida. We're going to go straight to the source, get this pure heroin, and that'll solve all our problems, right? Mm -hmm. And we're nearing the end of the movie because this is kind of like where everything gets set in motion. Uh, So Sarah gets picked she's on the subway train telling people she's gonna be on television which is i've never been to new york just but based just on the stories that i've heard this is like a normal thing that people see yeah every day. I, I have never been to new york but i did live in chicago for mm-hmm. a few years and yeah that stuff like that is very very common of just people wandering around yeah doing that sort of thing so tyrone and uh harry head off to florida in the car uh, what a horrible drive that would be to New God. York to Florida in one day. They say too they're gonna do it in one day. Oh, good yeah. Lord. Uh, they don't tell Marion. They they just go. So you know she. What is her motivation to go to this guy? Uh, I can't remember the character's name, but what is her motivation to go to this guy and be, basically become a prostitute to him specifically, like a call girl? 
Like, why doesn't he just, she just wait for them to return? Does she just assume they're not going to come back? Uh, oh, it's Big it, Tim. Sorry. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. But he calls um, himself but, Little John, which I think is hilarious for some reason. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Oh, that's because she's, he calls her Maid Marian. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways, so, yeah. Sh- what were you going to say? It's less funny now that. <laughs> okay. That. Um, I guess she's just, she needs a fix. So she needs the money. Yeah. And she's she, not she willing to wait. Like, she doesn't want to wait for them to get back. Yeah. She needs it. You know, that's, again, how strong her addiction is. Because yeah. I think that's her thing with. While she may have the biggest opportunity to get out. Yeah, in the easiest way. Yeah, exactly. But I feel like her addiction is maybe worse than the other two's as far you as think so? in regards to how what she'll do to get yeah. those. Because I think Sarah is the, by far the worst. Oh, no, like... no, yeah. She is definitely by far of the whole, of the four main characters, she's mm-hmm. definitely the worst. But speaking just to the three involved with the heroine. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know, just from the way they play it, Marion might kind of be the worst as far as addiction to it goes. Yeah. Most, I guess because she has such an easy out. Yeah. Compared to the rest of them, yeah. Um, so I didn't know this, but apparently uh, the office that Sarah goes to is Malin and Block's office. Like the phone call that she got. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know. I thought it was just a random place she went to. Um huh. But yeah, she goes in there, asks, you know, she's a mess, obviously, asking why she hasn't got a phone call or got a letter saying when she's going to be on TV. And basically people realize, okay, this is an insane woman Mm -hmm. uh, and she's taken into care uh, like a hospice, I guess, or straight to the hospital, really. Yeah. Um, And let's cut back. We'll see Harry and Tyrone. Uh, Harry's arm is just too fucking bad for them to go any further. So they go to the hospital. And of course, with a uh, you know an arm like that, they immediately know it's drugs, so they have to call the authorities. And this is where I think kind of the sense of like a hyper reality kind of comes into play, where yeah, it's for sure. a little dramatized. Where you know, in real life, they would treat him no matter what. Yeah. Um, but here they just go straight to the police. They don't bother. Same thing with. Uh, That's what happens when it's Dylan Baker as your yeah. <laughs> so, um, same thing happens with uh, Sarah. They don't like uh, try to do anything other than like just. I mean, they try force feeding her, food, uh, feeding tubes, electroshock therapy. You know. that, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's hard to watch in this movie, but that scene is yeah definitely. I one think of the them. hardest, more so than the electroshock therapy. I think watching her being force fed yes. and have the feeding tube put in is by far the most unsettling image in the movie. Is them shoving that feeding tube in her mouth. Um. So yeah, Marion decides to go meet Big Tim. Um, who is just a smooth talking pimp? <laughs> There's no other way around it. Uh, man, just he. You're not wrong. <laughs> but the thing is, I don't consider him that. Like he's supposed to play it off as like this villain, but I don't see him as a villain. I see him as just a guy with money that's you know doing what he wants. He's paying for call girls, basically, which <laughs> not a good practice. Right, right. But you know, not necessarily villainous I yeah guess. just you know he's a catalyst for her addiction that's okay. he's enabling her more yeah, yeah, so i guess that's sure. the only true villainous thing but um like he's, and, not, he's not necessarily a good person but no, he's not no. the worst person I guess, he's either. also manipulative in the sense too that right. he convinces her to come back even though she says no um and that kind of puts her further into this prostitution thing and then so i think this is where we're kind of like getting to the climax of everything so uh Harry and Tyrone are arrested and, you know, Tyrone is forced into labor in the prison and Harry's arm is so bad that they start sending him to the prison doctors to basically amputate it. And Mm -hmm. we're all building up to this amputation. That's the peak of the climax. Right. While we're doing that, we're also seeing uh, Sarah going through, like I said, being force fed, getting a feeding tube in her. um, The electro shock. And... The, again, this sense of hyper reality or whatever. I feel like they could easily tell she's on diet pills because yeah. they they even ask her. He's like, "When did you start taking the pills?" Blah blah blah. That seems like something that can easily be treated with other types of medication. And I guess they just consider it too far gone. They just yeah. need to go straight to the electroshock. Um, 
so yeah, she gets she's having her electroshock therapy at the same time. We're watching uh Tyrone and Harry's climax occur. Meanwhile, while we're, Marion. While we're also intercutting with Marion, going to this uh business executive high roller party in this apartment that's just hookers and drugs and strobe lights and dildos and all this whole fantastical sense of party. Um that culminates is the yeah, word you use to describe it. Culminates uh in the classic improvised line, ass to ass, yeah. right? Just, Maybe probably one of the, oddly enough, one of the most quoted things from this movie. Probably out of all the things that happened in this movie, that's the one people remember. But, uh, and we were talking about this today. I originally had the censored version of the of this movie, which is the same movie, except this scene with Marion is a little, uh, they, they, uh, cut, they cut out some of the nudity. Yeah, uh, you some, see, it's mostly shots. It's mostly of face shots. Her face. Yeah. As opposed um, to the copy I have, which shows everything. a lot more than her face. Uh, which originally got this movie an NC-17 rating, but yeah. Aronofsky told him, you know, that's the whole point of this movie is it's supposed yeah. to be fucked up. And, you know, so kind of he kind of got away with it there. Um, but yeah, so she that's her climax is, you know, no pun intended. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's, just it's couldn't that, resist. Low, hang, low hanging fruit. I couldn't take. Um, yeah, so that culminates at the same time that Sarah's going through electroshock therapy and Harry is getting his arm amputated. So, this is the whole point of the podcast, right? The ending. Huh. Let's talk about it. So, who do you want to? Who you want to talk about first? I guess Tyrone's probably the easiest let's see, let's one. Let's go, Tyrone. Okay. Tyrone is in prison, and it doesn't look like he's getting out anytime soon. He's stirring the biggest vat of mashed potatoes I've ever seen. In I my guess life. that's mashed potatoes, right? That's with yeah, the, they have, uh, the cameo the, from the author. Yeah, the cameo from the author playing the prison guard, watching him. Just, but I don't know if he's just saying the word mashed potatoes, or if that's literally what he's in, like. What Tyrone's character is doing at the moment. It's he just has this big wooden spoon. Stirring mashed potato. It has to be mashed potatoes. Do, 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 do they do that? Maybe that's like the kitchen duty. That's what I'm assuming. Because I can't imagine they just have people just out there just because normally it's license plates or whatever. No, that ha- no, that has to be. It. Why, <laughs> would just, it, why would it be anywhere else besides it's like, the kitchen? It's like craft outsources their <laughs> their their mashed potato department to oh, prisons. Man. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even know if Kraft makes mashed potatoes. That's um, it's macaroni and cheese. You're yeah. Um. So Tyrone. Uh, curls up on his little cot in the fetal position while we see visions of him with his mother. Yeah. Um, as a kid, and then we cut to I think Marion's next. Yeah. Marion's next. We see her. She's arrived home from her her party, fantastical party, as you put it. <laughs> well, fantastical in nature, not in uh, her aspect of it. Okay. Um, but she's got just a stack of money, right? And I don't know if you've noticed this too, but she's got a smile on her face. Yeah. Right? And it, it bothers me every single time. Yeah. And here's what I'm saying. We talked about this too, watching the ending of the movie, is that's her way out. That's another way out she's got. She's got this money. She's got all she's surrounded by all these, you know, drawings of all these clothes that she wants to design and make that she can easily do it. She she's got the studio. They bought that uh, that uh commercial property mm-hmm. near the beginning they, she's got the she's got the means to do it but do you think she ends up doing it or do you think she sticks in the cycle of just prostitution well, just, and self if she deprecation hadn't smiled at the end i would say maybe she has a chance of getting out but that smile just it's not a happy kind of smile it's uh it's almost like a a comfort from for the wrong reasons kind of right smile. right but yeah i don't like I said, just from my point of view, like I feel like out, outside of Sarah, obviously, mm-hmm. she just goes to such crazy lengths to get her hands on, you know, the drug. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't really, of all of them, I think I don't really see her kind of getting away safely from it, to be honest. Yeah. Plus, I feel like Big Tim's kind of got like this mental hold over her. Uh, as I kind of show you a little earlier. Anyways, so she's got all this money and she curls up in the fetal position on her couch. She doesn't get that uh, transparent kind of background no. uh, vision that everyone else does. Uh, I guess let's go to Harry first. Okay. Because in the movie we actually do see him first. But Yeah, yeah. So Harry calls out for Marion. 
Uh, and this nurse is there, says, oh, we'll send for her. She'll come. And he's like, no, she won't. And yeah. we pull out to find out, yep, his he's lost his arm. His arm has been amputated. Which in him and Tyrone, that it didn't really click in my head till now. Him and Tyrone are in jail in most likely Florida. Yeah. They're not in. Yeah. They, and they're not getting back anytime no. soon. So. So, yeah, that never really occurred to me that. Yeah. And he's probably going back at, into that prison after, you know, yeah, recovering. Stub heels. Yeah. Oh, Jeez. Man. Yeah. That just put an even <laughs> bigger down on it. <laughs> and let's uh, let's let's wrap up the, the ending with uh, Sarah. So Sarah is in this mental oh. hospital. Her hair has been cut. Her friends come and see her and just just Man, uh, that, that reveal shot of her of with her, her hair with cut her, and it's like white in hair the, in like the weird hospital gown, gown the yeah, short yeah. hair. Just she's almost got like Man. that Kubrick thousand yard stare that he does in his yeah, movies. Yeah. Um, she curl- she's having these visions again of the infomercial and she curls up in the fetal position as well. And we cut to uh, her hallucination again of the infomercial. And of course she's got the big, nice red fluffy dress on her hair is done and they bring Harry out and saying that, Oh, he's getting married. He's this nice businessman. Now he's got his hair, you know, a comb over going on and they hug each other and say they love each other. And then yeah. that's it. That's the end of the movie. It's just a grand uh, illusion. All right, so that <laughs> <laughs> that's the film, right? Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the trivia about the film before we go into what the silver lining is, okay? I want to talk a little bit about, as I was talking about this last night, the just the look of the, this. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous movie. Right. It's. We, I was like talking about that today, too, that it's... Uh, it's got like a, a really soft kind of glow to it. Right. Um, yeah, everything kind of has this this glow around the edges. All the all the characters do. It's very soft. There's mm-hmm. yeah parts where it goes in and out of focus. Um, wh- what were you gonna say? Well, I was just uh, like the cinematographer. What's his name? Matthew Libetique. I don't know if that's how you Matthew Libetique. Yeah, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I think, I think that sounds familiar. Yeah, but he in my opinion, knocked it out of the park yeah. in this, which talk about this a little bit earlier today with you, some of the other stuff he's done. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I know his name, but I'm not, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Uh, he's, he's done. He's pretty much, he pretty much did all of Aronofsky's films except the wrestler. Okay. So black Swan, no, I found yeah. fountain, but little, Fun fact, some of the other movies he has worked on. Okay. The year after he did Requiem, his next film, Josie and the Pussycats. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Going on from there, uh, Gothica. Okay. Phone Booth, which I will defend Phone, oh, yeah, booth, phone booth all day. I could see Phone Booth, yeah. Uh, the number 23. I guess I can see that. Iron Man 1 and 2. And I didn't know that. I know you'll appreciate this one. One of his most recent works, Straight Outta Compton. <laughs> oh, I know him. He's a he's an Asian American, right? Matthew Libatique? I believe he is. I have no idea. I believe he is. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. That's funny. Josie and the Pussycats it definitely sticks out. That's funny. Yeah, that was kind of an odd <laughs> choice. At all. The, um, the other ones kind of make sense, but that's definitely the one that's. Well, let's talk about let's talk about the the cinematography here. So, um. I'm going to read some trivia. You can pull this up on IMDb. It's nothing, you know, I'm not doing too much research here. but <laughs> um, And this is probably well known, too, if you know this movie. Um, Ellen Bernstein's uh, monologue that we talked about earlier uh-huh. about growing old. Um, the camera apparently drifts off a little bit during this scene, which I still don't fully see it. Yeah, I mean, we, we noticed a we little bit. We watched that scene earlier. And we noticed, and, a, I mean, it's a little, right. a, a little bit, but... Apparently this happened because it's a really tight shot, so I can see why it could be easy to drift off. But apparently this was because uh, Matthew was, I guess, also being camera off for this. Okay. He began crying during yeah. her monologue because it was so impassioned that he fogged up the eyepiece in the camera in the viewfinder. And so he couldn't see necessarily where exactly Ellen Burstein was in the frame. <laughs> and that was the take they ended up using in the final movie, which... I've been a ca- uh, camera operator before mm-hmm. during pivotal moments of scenes, and it definitely you can oh, definitely yeah. feel 
in your movement in your hand because you have to be smooth to be a camera operator so it's like you can feel when you're like getting off balance and well, especially can, like just imagine hearing that monologue again mm-hmm. for the very first time mm-hmm. and you might have to do multiple takes of it too yeah which is already like a chore not just for her but for the whole crew to get around and to watch that so i thought that was pretty interesting yeah um it's more trivia so let's talk some more about ellen bernstein actually uh when she first read the script uh darren aronofsky actually offered it straight to her she was horrified of the script and she flat out said no really yeah um she then went and went back and rewatched his first movie pie uh and she just changed her mind she's like yeah i'll do it i guess okay. she i guess if you probably sat down and read this script without seeing without knowing the movie you'd probably yeah. turn away too because it probably yeah. reads probably reads a lot more horribly than what you've seen on the final maybe yeah uh, I've, I've never read the book neither have i from a few people i know that have apparently the book gets a like even a little more dark at some parts that's which hard I to believe can't too. even imagine yeah um she did an interview with Charlie Rose on his show and said that this was her uh, best acting achievement was this role. Completely agreed. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen her a lot of things, but yeah, this is definitely by far the, the biggest and probably the best for her. Well, again, the the entire cast is just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Marlon Wayans is phenomenal. I don't, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen him do anything this with this much like intensity. Yeah. I, I mean, has he, what other, I guess like, drama films has he done oh, no, let's look it I up. can't think of anything besides comedy yeah I mean I immediately go to like the scary movies and like the the parody films but let's look it up what, what else is Marlon Wayans Wayne's done the Wayans Brothers TV show yeah yeah that's a good point uh, it's in his top four like known for on IMDb is uh, Scary Movie 1 2 White Chicks and Requiem for a Dream so there's that um, let's one of these see. things is not like yeah, the for real. Um, oh yeah I forgot he was in the Dungeon and Dragons movie Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. He plays a character called Snails. Ah. Uh, yeah, no, nothing, dude. Yeah. Not that I've seen anyway. Huh. It's all comedy after that. So that's interesting. He kills it, too, in this movie. Um, He's due for, like, a comeback of some sort. He, he, he can do drama, definitely. He's yeah. good in this. Without a doubt, he definitely yeah. can. Um, So, yeah, Aronofsky also asked... Uh, this this is a big one to me. He asked Jared Leto and Marlon Wayans to avoid sex and sugar for 30 days prior to filming in order to better understand an overwhelming craving. So I think I could go probably 30 days without sex. Mm-hmm. 30 days without sugar would be tough just because that it, would be it, it, oh it goes back to that whole diet thing where it's like it's harder with food, I think, to give up something than yeah. it is anything else. Um, just because you're so, you do it every day. You're yeah, so accustomed exactly. to it. So, but I, I mean, I can definitely see Jared Leto doing it because he is one of those kind of method actor kind of really puts himself in the role. Yeah. Speaking of which, he also lost 25 pounds uh, for this movie and Jesus. became friends with real heroin junkies in of Brooklyn. He did. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right? Of course, of course he, did. he did. Um, so this one is kind of a little too on the nose for me, but this goes back to the to the to the book, not Aronofsky or okay. the script. Uh, the four main characters. Uh, their last names reflect what their uh, their drugs are, basically, what okay. their addiction is. So we have Sarah and Harry Goldfarb, uh, Marion Silver, and Tyrone Love. Okay, which oh. Ty- yeah, Sarah wants to be glamorous, so there's the gold <laughs> in her name. Uh, Marion and Harry want to start their own business, Goldfarb and Silver. So gold and silver make okay. money. That makes sense. And Tyrone wants a better home than what his mother provided for him. So he wants love. Okay? Huh. But I feel like that's a little on the nose. Yeah. Uh, Gold Farm's an okay last name, but how often do you meet somebody with the last name Love? No. Yeah, I don't think I've ever. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Love, but... Um, yeah, I feel like that was a little on the nose for the most part. But, I mean, I guess it works in the in the grand scheme of things. Because, you know, I don't think you ever really hear Tyrone's last name in the movie. Yeah, I can't. I had no idea what his last name was until yeah. you just mentioned that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, let's talk about Tabby Tibbins a little more. You know, he mentions in his infomercial for his 
program, uh, no sugar, number mm-hmm. one, no red meat. We never hear the third one. Right. And in fact, anytime Sarah's about to hear the third one, something happens on screen, either yep. she freaks out or something happens, you know. Um, Aronofsky said he wanted the third step to be uh, the removal of pharma of pharmaceuticals. So basically no pills. Right. Which is kind which, of like a slap in the face. It's kind of like that whole thing in Castaway. What, like, uh, what was in the FedEx box? Oh, it was a satellite phone. Yeah. You know, um, which I, again, that would work so well for this bleak ending, kind uh-huh. of like just another slap in the face, you know. Um, the film producers said that they wanted them to change that because they were concerned that pharmaceutical companies would feel that the film's message was targeting them or encouraging people to stop taking medication. Okay, it's a good note. Yeah, you know, it's a good enough. studio note. So they kind of had a compromise. Aronofsky said that uh, the third step was then going to be no orgasms. Okay. Okay. Which I think is kind of funny because I um. Well, no, I guess Harry does too. I was gonna say Sarah's the only person in the movie of the main four that we don't see have sex, but I don't think we ever see Harry either. We see Tyrone uh, with his girlfriend. We see Marion a number of times, but I don't think him and Harry ever do. Which also, which if it's, if that's true, right, actually, if that's true, that's another slap in the face to to Marion and her addiction. She doesn't even have sex with her boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's another layer that I never noticed until just now. <laughs> See, this podcast teaches you things already. Episode I'm one. learning so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got two more th- trivia notes that I want to talk about because I think they're pretty important. Um, Aronofsky has said uh, that the film isn't about uh, addiction to drugs. Uh, he said it's about a, an exploration of different types. Uh, he mentions, you know, the Harry Tyrone Marion story is a very traditional heroin story. Um, but when you put it side by side with Sarah's story, you kind of have this idea of, okay, what is a quote unquote drug? Yeah. Um, which I think in today's age, we both kind of, uh, consider both to be drugs, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, you know, uh, he said the idea that the same inner monologue that goes through a person's head when they're trying to quit drugs and cigarettes, um, as to when they're not, when, when they're trying to not eat food so they can lose 20 pounds. Uh, really fascinated him. Uh, it's kind of the same kind of mentality, the same kind of addiction in terms of, in, in his mind, mm-hmm. which I guess I can kind of understand. I think it's pretty yeah. hard to quit food, just like it's pretty hard to quit, you know, drugs. I think drugs is more of a physical addiction, whereas food is more of a mental self control right. kind of thing. <clears throat> um, and the last thing is, we actually talked about this, um, and we're gonna, we'll talk about it too with our silver lining. Darren Aronofsky said that Tyrone is the only person capable of reclaiming his life uh, at the end of the movie. Um, you know, in the prison, he's recalling memories of his mother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, that's again, we, we talked about that earlier. Um, so you th- who do you think has the best chance of uh, getting out of this addictive lifestyle? Uh, well, like I said, I definitely don't think it's Marion. I don't see her. Mm hmm really ever escaping its clutches um and you're talking about the mental the constitute of the addiction not right. the physical limitations or whatever right okay um no i i agree that um, tyrone probably has the best chance um i think he has the best chance of breaking his addiction for sure right. um like i don't harry and sarah both just left in such dark places very dismal at the end of the movie especially sarah yeah um i mean as far as harry i don't know getting an arm cut off might make me rethink a few things (laughs) it might might put it all into perspective but again the movie ends before we see that yeah we don't see anything happen after those fetal positions yeah so i think the physical limitations i think marion definitely has the easiest way to to get her life back on track Uh, I think the mental, emotional stability, I think Tyrone easily can get himself mm-hmm. back away. From, I think being in jail now and seeing his friend lose an arm. Yeah. I think that's enough to make you want to quit doing anything. So, all right. We've talked about the movie. We've went through the whole movie beat by beat. We've talked about the ending. So, this movie obviously has a super bleak ending for every yes. character. Um, let's talk about the silver lining. That's the whole point of the podcast. What... 
is the glimmer of hope in this movie. If there is one, not every movie is going to have one that we do. Um, you have yours, I have mine. So, what do you think is the silver lining of Requiem for a Dream? What is something that you look at this movie and you're like, well, there's this. What do you think? I would say Sarah's hallucination that the thing that in the it the movie ends in Sarah's hallucination. Yeah. Her she's finally on television. She's, you know, Harry is getting married. He's a nice businessman now and just they hug and they're both crying telling them they love each other. Mm-hmm. Um so while it is a complete hallucination it's not actually happening Mm -hmm. like that moment is just after everything you've seen that moment just even though again it's dark because you know it's not real yeah i don't know that just kind of it perks you up a little little bit bit. yeah just like oh (laughs) they love each other Uh, yeah i agree Uh, i think in terms of the movie itself that's the best way to end it with a little bit of hope even though it's 100% 100% obviously it's, kind of, it's, a, it's false hope yeah it's a hallucination by far I mean there's no stretch of that but I think the silver lining is a little more uh, mental you know we just talked mm-hmm. about it I think the silver lining here is the fact that out of all these people they can still recover from you know maybe not Sarah maybe she's a little too far gone mm-hmm. but I think Tyrone in particular uh, like we said he has the best mental I think he's the strongest uh in a mental sort of sort of way. Oh yeah, no. He's got the strongest agree. mentality. I think he is the fact that he's I think he's learned his lesson at the end of the movie. Yeah. Uh I think once he gets out of jail, he's gonna be fine. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think he'll go back to his mom, get support. And it's a stretch. I'll go in and I'll admit it. It's a stretch. <laughs> but I think that's kind of what you take away from this is like you watch all these people destroy their lives and at the end they don't give you the hope that a normal movie would. You know, a normal movie would end with Tyrone getting out of jail and making his way back to New York right. to see his mom or wherever. But we don't, uh, we don't, we don't get, get that, that here. But, but I think the I think that he planted the seed. Aronofsky planted the seed that yeah. that is a possibility with that final image of him with his his mom. Um, so that's that's my silver lining of this movie. It's mm-hmm. even after all of this tragedies happen, there's still a chance you can come back. Yeah, at you least know? one of them still has a chance. Yeah, there. yeah. So, it's it's not as gradua- uh, grandiesque. <laughs> I can't even pronounce that word. You know what I mean. Not it's not try. as big of a silver lining <laughs> as maybe some other movies could be. But it's definitely there. There's definitely a silver lining here. The moral is, obviously, if you have an addiction, get help. Don't enable others. Uh, sure. I'm sure there's a lot of other themes you could take away from this. A lot of other moral lessons. Um so that is Requiem for a Dream. And something we're going to try and do every episode, <laughs> we can't necessarily guarantee, is we're going to try and give you uh, an alternative movie. Uh, what that mean, by that, mean we mean uh, a movie that can pick you back up yes. after watching Requiem for a Dream. So if you want to do a double feature back-to-back, uh, you could watch Requiem, and then you could watch this movie. Uh, that way we're not just leaving you on a depressing note. We're giving you something to look forward to. So we're going to try and also tie the movies in together. Uh with some kind of theme, so the movies aren't just like polar opposites. Mm-hmm. So for me, I'm going to recommend if you watched Requiem for Your Dream and you want to watch another movie afterwards, that's going to kind of bring you back up in spirit that you know won't leave you just on a drag all day. Uh, it also has to do with drugs. I'm going to say watch uh, Friday with Ice Cube and Chris <laughs> Tucker. I think it's a funny movie. It also deals with drugs, a little bit of addiction, not necessarily. Um, but it, it kind of is like the more comedic, improvised kind of version. Friday of is the more comedic Requiem for a Dream. Yes, 100%. <laughs> you can quote me on that. But yeah, Friday is a fun movie. If you haven't seen it, and you want, if you haven't seen Requiem, and you want to watch these movies back to back, I'd recommend that. Watch Requiem first, get the cries, the feels out, and then have some fun with Friday. Uh, what about you, Matt? What would your uh, recommendation be uh, as a pick-me-up? Sticking with the drug theme, uh-huh. I'm going to recommend Pineapple Express. <laughs> okay. That's a good one because there, it's just it's on the complete other end of the spectrum mm-hmm. from Requiem. It's even further than Friday. Yes. Yeah, that's a hundred percent comedy. <laughs> um. Yeah. That all. Although I don't know, that might be too big of an emotional stretch over the course of one day to <laughs> that go would from be that a, point a, to that a point, hard but shift. Yeah, but it's, that's the point. It's, a, it's to pick you up 
after you've had this downer moment. So you definitely need to be brought up after this movie. Agreed. So that is Requiem for a Dream from the year 2000, uh, directed by Darren Aronofsky. That is our silver lining, uh, and this is episode one in our silver linings playlist. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. Please leave us feedback and a rating. Uh, if you have a recommendation for a movie that you think has a bleak ending that you want us to try and find the silver lining to, <laughs> let us know. Uh, leave us a, a message or a comment uh, on our Facebook, which will include our Facebook link in the show notes. Yes. Uh, and again, thank you for listening, guys. This was this was a good first episode, I think. Mm-hmm. Thanks, guys. And um, and you know, look f- we'll be on the lookout for new episodes. We'll you know maybe add features and mm-hmm. change our structure around. But I think this is a pretty solid idea. A pretty solid structure we got going on. Um, it's worked for, out well so far. Yeah, yeah this is pretty <laughs> good. Um, so, do you have any last words, Miley, before we sign off? Or I want to curl up in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to watch Requiem for a while, huh? I Okay, <laughs> let me end with a short little story. I used to work third shift, and when I, I didn't have cable... So, going to sleep at 7 a.m. every morning, (laughs) I had a choice of two DVDs to watch. Requiem for a Dream or Wedding Crashers. (laughs) So, after you wore out Wedding Crashers... I had no choice (laughs) but to watch this movie if I wanted to watch something. It was a dark time. I think I've probably seen this movie maybe four times. I think I've maybe seen it 400. Jeez, fuck that. And (laughs) every single time... What do you rate this on Aronofsky's uh, filmography? I think it's probably number one for me. Oh man, like it's up there. It's it's right up there between this and The Fountain. Okay, which you still need to see. Yeah, I haven't seen it. The Fountain. I highly recommend The Fountain to anyone. That All right, movie is amazing, but it's definitely a it's a close call between this and The Fountain. Fair enough. All right. Uh, I think we might not necessarily on this episode because we haven't figured it out yet. But I think we, what we might do is we might tease the next week's episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for now, you're shit out of luck. Just figure it out <laughs> on your own. Go watch some sad movies, uh, some sad endings. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening again. Uh, I'm Dustin Goes to Hollywood. I'm uh, Mally Moore. And I think we're going to try and sign off with a catchphrase every episode. So you ready? Excelsior! Excelsior.